people who hate modernist architecture the most, who are most vehement about it, um, have decided to associate it with, with the worst things they possibly can. Um, it's communism. It's the Nazis. Uh, it must be some sign of undue influence on America. I'm Todd Miller with Isaiah Industries, proud sponsor of the Construction Disruption Podcast. If you're a specialty home improvement contractor, you're no doubt very busy, but you also know how important it is to stay on the lookout for new opportunities. One of the most exciting opportunities today is with high quality and beautiful residential metal roofing. Metal now has a 15% share of the residential roofing market and it's growing each year. At Isaiah Industries, we help contractors just like you across the world incorporate our exclusive and value-laden products into their businesses using our proven systems for lead generation, including our exciting Engage in-home sales presentation and demo. Drop me a note at tmiller at isaiahindustries.com if you'd like to have a conversation about how we can help you get a head start in one of the most exciting and growth poised segments of home improvement. Welcome to the Construction Disruption Podcast, where we uncover the future of building and remodeling by holding in-depth conversations with forward thinkers from the design and construction industry, as well as just others in the know. Each episode of Construction Disruption digs into an industry that's always evolving, always changing with new products, designs, practices, and technologies. Construction Disruption is created and sponsored by Isaiah Industries, manufacturer of specialty metal roofing systems and other building materials. I'm Todd Miller of Isaiah Industries. Our co-host today is our sales manager, Seth Heckeman, creative director, Ryan Bell, and content creator, Ethan Young, our, our behind the scenes production team. So it's kind of interesting. We're recording this right now. We're approaching uh, Christmas. This will probably air after Christmas, I'm sure. But uh, we find ourselves here this year at Christmas time with Ethan in a very interesting predicament. Um, you know, the, all four of us guys here uh, putting together construction disruption are, are uh, oh, excuse me, three of the four are married. Ethan is the one who's single. And what we found this year is that apparently a lot of ladies out there are asking for a good man from Santa. They're telling Santa they want a good man for Christmas. We have had six times now that elves have been trying to kidnap <laughs> Ethan. It's just been absolutely <laughs> crazy. Uh, but what a position to be in, I guess. <laughs> okay, y'all can't see him, but I did just make him turn a little bit red. <laughs> Anyway, uh, so Seth, um, we've got a big event coming up in early 2022. Man, that's hard to say, 2022. Um, tell us a little bit about that. We do. Yeah, we're in the throes now of planning our uh, next metal roofing summit. So we have been on hiatus for a year. We did it uh, virtually a couple of years ago with the pandemic, but we're coming back together April 26th through the 28th uh, to uh, bring, uh, hopefully, a great event of education and networking to the industry. Again, we call it the Metal Roofing Summit, but uh, really uh, anyone looking for sales, high quality sales and marketing training information, uh, networking with leaders in the industry uh, across residential remodeling. Uh, it's going to be a fantastic opportunity to um, get back out there, learn some new good things, get back together finally, and uh, really looking forward to it. Uh, you know, each we, each year we are trying to improve it, keep pushing the envelope, trying new things. Uh, I know we're excited. We feel like we're taking that next, next step up with um, booking a, a great conference center down in Dayton um, and bringing them some fantastic Fantastic speakers, some of which have been construction disruption guests, and I know we want to get others on in the future. Uh, you'll be speaking Frank Farmer of American Metal Roofs, uh, Chuck Toki, uh, Joseph Hughes, uh, Megan Beatty. I'm really excited about the agenda we're putting together, so uh, it's going to be a great, great time. Um, registration is open now. It will be open when this airs and, and through the event, uh, metalroofingsummit.com. Again, that's going to be April 26th through the 28th. 
Cool, and we're going big time in Dayton, Ohio, so that's exciting. We're moving up from Piqua, Ohio, so uh, I'm excited. And if, and if I can throw a little bit teaser in, because I am really excited about this, um, down the road, even though Metal Roofing Summit has been a great brand and it's been a great way to pull together contractors really interested in metal roofing, uh, we really see this as a conference um, that we want to expand clearly beyond that and bring in folks who are interested just in the future of construction and remodeling and, and such things. Uh, so down the road, um, I really shouldn't even say this, but I'm going to anyway, uh, we may see the name of Metal Roofing Summit be construction disruption conference so uh, who knows that's exciting so we appreciate all of our loyal listeners and viewers out there um, who have helped us create the construction disruption brand and uh, we're excited about expanding that in future years as well so good stuff well, today's guest, let's just dive right into things. Today's guest is George Smart. Um, George is the executive director, host, and producer of U.S. Modernist Radio. Um, George is also an executive coach and management consultant, uh, but his work with U.S. Modernist Radio comes out of his appreciation and love uh, for modernist architecture. Um, his weekly podcasts are always entertaining. They're, they're really fun to listen to, incredibly informative. Um, he sometimes throws music in there as well, which we need to think about that. We can get you singing and playing guitar, <laughs> me see. just listening politely. Um, but he'll, he'll, he, he does his podcasts, and they, he, he and his crew talk and laugh with people um, who enjoy, who maybe own or create or dream about or Maybe they're involved in preservation, but and maybe they love modern art, modernist architecture, or maybe they hate it. Uh, but they have something uh, to create a great conversation about. And uh, of course, modernist architecture includes uh, some of the most uh, exciting, um, but also probably what's historically been some of the most controversial buildings in the world as well. Uh, with a focus on residential architecture, U.S. Modernist. Dot org is the website. Um, it's a great website, usmodernist.org, for people who want to dig further into this topic. Um, George, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, myself, as someone who does, uh, not near the expert you are, but someone who does appreciate modernist architecture and design, I'm really looking forward to a fun conversation. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad to be here. Great. Well, thank you very much. And you're joining us from Durham, North Carolina, correct? That's right. Awesome. Um, so I know that even though you've done some podcasts where you've been the guest, usually uh, you're more accustomed to being the interviewer. Interviewer, um, We're kind of turning the tables on you here today, putting you in the hot seat for a change. But I'd like to jump right in and have you tell our viewers and listeners um, a bit about U.S. Modernist Radio. Um, what can you tell us about the format, what you're accomplishing, um, what maybe your typical guests and topics might be? Sure, I'd be glad to. But um, I want to go back to one of your earlier points. Uh, you really do got to change the name of that conference. I mean, Metal Roofing Summit? <laughs> what could be more awful than going to a Metal Roofing Summit? <laughs> I mean, you got it. Construction disruption. You know, that's it. That's your <laughs> whole theme. You got to switch to that right away. No one wants to go to a metal roofing summit. <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> we do get a few people, but usually it's the same people every year. So, yeah. so we're going. They're just trying to escape their families. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> there may be some of that. Yeah, definitely more. They sizzle. would go to a cardboard roofing summit if one was offered. <laughs> All right. So the podcast. Yes. Please. Um, we are going into our eighth year. It is a show for the general public about modernist architecture to help create awareness about what it is, uh, give examples, um, let people explore their love of modern architecture, because uh, while it's not a, a widespread fascination, it's never caught on with a massive number of people in the general public ever in the last hundred years. But for those people who love it, they really, really love it, and they, they love learning more. So we have had um, approaching about 250 shows with guests from all over the spectrum. We've had architects, of course, but a lot of homeowners, um, critics, uh, developers, builders, a lot of people that uh, folks might encounter if they're thinking about 
uh, building or restoring or remodeling a modernist house, a lot of historians, so they can share the story about how this has evolved. And we also bring on some haters, some people that really cannot stand modernist architecture <laughs> and let them rant about how terrible it is and how it's going to bring about the fall of the world. <laughs> <laughs> that has to be good. So we may have some folks out there right now are kind of quizzically scratching their heads, trying to place what modernist architecture looks like. Um, can you give us a quick overview, overview, maybe a little bit about the time frame, uh, some of the major designers, maybe some examples of buildings that, you know, will click in their head and they think, oh, yeah, I know what you're talking about, um, or some other visual description that will help folks say, that's what modernist design is. Well, the best description is that weird house in your neighborhood <laughs> because it's probably modernist. Regardless of where you are. Yeah, regardless of where you're located, it's that weird house. Modernist houses tend to have four characteristics. They tend to have flat or low-pitched roofs. They tend to have unusual geometries. They tend to have um, a lot of openings, a lot of glass, uh, courtyards, atriums, skylights, um, features that bring the outside in. And then, although this is not innovative anymore, back in the day, the open floor plan was a radical departure from traditional design. The idea of having your living room flow into your dining room, flow into your kitchen, was a real innovation. And now, almost all construction does that. Mm -hmm. So, um, if you take those four characteristics, it eliminates... About 99.75% uh, of all the houses in America. But for those that are left, um, it's pretty cool. I'm kind of curious. As, as I think about design, it, it almost seems like in my mind that the world went from Victorian design to modernist. It, it may be a little bit of arts and crafts or something in between. Um, what do you think were some of the factors that led to modernist design? Because it really was so I feel at least, I, I guess I wasn't alive at the time, but it feels like it was extremely revolutionary. Um, was it just, you think, incredible creativity on the part of a few and um, perhaps timing? Or was there something in the water that all of a sudden a lot of people were influenced, perhaps by a World's Fair or something that, that led to it? Um, what, what do you think led up to the development of it? Well, there was an alien who went back in time and changed the water supply and that's what brought it all about. I think you're right dead on with this. This is a great theory. <laughs> we're, we're just on top of everything here today, solving all the world problems. <laughs> yeah. Um, essentially, this was just, you know, an evolution. I mean, it could have gone in different directions. We had Victoria and we had Art Deco. We had Prairie Style. We've had styles that have been with us a long time, Federal Style, Georgian Style, Cape Cod Style. Sure. Um, you know, um, all of these have been with us and, and, and are still with us. I mean, they're still making Victorians in some places. Um, but the idea was behind modernism was to accomplish a couple of goals about lifestyle. One was to focus on the house, making you feel better by bringing in more light, more air supply. Um, the advent of central heating and air and other energy technologies made some of this more possible. Also, you had the idea of modernism being unadorned. And what that means is, is that almost all the buildings of, let's say, the 20s were very adorned. You, you know, there would be um, wall railing around every dining room and in the corners and all this filigree and a house was evaluated and how much, how ornate it was. It showed you how much money, basically, somebody has by the ornateness. Modernism really focused on how do we shape the house to be more of a, uh, a vessel or a machine for living to improve the way that people live in it? And um, consequently, the designs were quite different from what had gone on before. Uh, people look at these houses sometimes or photos of them and go, well, you know, that's, that's cold. I, why would I want to live in something so plain and unadorned until they actually spend a couple of nights in one? and find out that it's pretty cool and relaxing and they feel like uh, they can just visibly feel the difference. Very interesting. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, 
as I think about it, you think of coming out of Victorian into the Art Deco and you did have all of that. And then, you know, suddenly you just had this major change. And yeah, there's just something cool about modernist design. I mean, you know, you think of yourself being in Palm Springs or uh, out on the Pacific, look, you know, looking over the ocean or something and uh, just something relaxing and neat about that. Well, when you and I first connected, you were really quick to point out to me, Todd, I'm not an architect. I'm not sure if I'm what you're looking for. Uh, but I said, I think you're exactly what we're looking for. Um, but I'm curious, what were some of the things that kind of drove and inspired or influenced uh, your interest in, in modernism? Well, my career up until I started this organization was as a management consultant, doing strategic planning for major corporations and serving as an executive coach for smaller businesses. Um, it was great for a long time, but you get to the point when you've been in a couple of decades where people are paying you very well to give them advice that they in turn ignore, <laughs> which is kind of disheartening. Um, so um, about 15 years ago, I was looking to build a new house. I was Googling in my area and found photos of these houses, including one um, that was probably the, the second most house, second most known house in North Carolina after Biltmore, the castle. Mm -hmm. And it was called the Catalano House. And I was so sad to read just a few years before I found this web page that the house had been destroyed out of neglect. And so I thought I would make a list of houses that were from this era so perhaps I could, you know, visit them or keep them from being destroyed too. And that list has grown from one house essentially to about 5,000 houses that we have at ncmodernist.com. And then about seven years ago, we expanded nationally and formed the website usmodernist.com where we've documented 12,000 houses across the country, every Wright, every Neutra, every Schindler, every Elwood, every Richard Meyer, every Soriano, all the great names. And from that came the podcast. So our goal here really is to be the go-to information source so that buyers and sellers and realtors and architects and builders um, can, can know what they have on their hands. And we've also added in the last eight years a giant resource library of four million pages. Essentially, every architecture magazine ever published in the U.S. in the last hundred years. So if a house was published, you can go in there, look it up by keyword, find it, and get original photos of it, plus information about it. And, and quite often, if it was a commercial magazine, you'll have ads from all the vendors of that era. So you can find, you know, some of the fixtures and fittings and appliances and so forth and find out if they're still available. Very interesting. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of, Seth was remarking to me earlier, reminding me, we actually have had our products used on a couple of Frank Lloyd Wright houses in the Chicago area, which I started poking around on your website. And there's, of course, such a clustering of them up in that area. I wasn't able to pull out yet the ones that uh, our product is on, but uh, always really neat when we get involved in projects like that. Yeah, restoration projects are, uh, are really fun because you are up to the challenge of replacing something as closely as you can to look like the original. But of course, you want it to be more durable than the original was because material science really has come a long way in the last hundred years. And it's made possible you know, that you can build something that looks any way you want to. I mean, Frank Gehry couldn't be who he is without material science coming along and making these things strong. Absolutely. Are, are there any particular maybe manufacturers or even types of products that you're seeing out there where a lot of uh, development has been made in terms of current, maybe not reproduction products per se, but products that substitute well or work well on modernist architecture, but yet bring new technology to them? Well, I mean, one easy one is in Windows. You know, window technology was really pretty primitive 100 years ago. Now you've got not just glass, but 100 different types of glass with different properties, different colors, glass that changes colors, glass that insulates, Single glass, double glass, triple glass, glazed glass. You know, it's just, it's just so many choices. You can have 
uh, regular windows, adjustable windows, movable windows, motorized windows. So if you're fixing up a house, um, you know, you can have a stronger glass with higher insulation quality and, and try to get it to look as close as you can to the original and come up with a better overall solution. I think it was a few years ago, I remember, I think Anderson Windows actually had a, um, what I want to call sort of a grouping of windows that were stealing from some uh, right designs and use some of his uh, things, I think, especially from his, uh, what is it, the Oak Park uh, residence and yeah. studio and everything. Yeah, and uh, most of the large window manufacturers, Anderson, Marvin, and so forth, have a line of windows just for modern buildings. Interesting. Well, I know one of the things that uh, those couple of houses that we've done up in the Chicago market uh, that were right homes, um, both used a very low profile, simplistic sort of metal shingle that was similar to what was originally wood shingles on those uh, particular homes. And so they were able to reproduce that look, but have something that was going to be far more durable. So as you look back over the nearly 250 episodes uh, you've done of U.S. Modernist Radio, um, any one or two stand out in your mind as particular favorites? I think sometimes as, as we've done more podcasting, my favorite tends to be the last one we did because I probably remember of course, it the most. Yeah. But anything really stand out in your mind as some of your favorites? Well, we, we've had some we're just a wonderful array of guests over time, and we are we generally run about six to eight weeks ahead with our shows between the time we record them and the time we put them on. So we're now into February. Um, one of the shows that I love to talk about is the Ferris Bueller House, which is in Chicago. Uh, you all remember that from the movie where the Ferrari rolled out of the modern house? I, I absolutely do. I don't know about my uh, compadre, compadres here or not, but. I don't know if they, they should go and watch they Ferris Bueller's to. Day Off. It's a classic film. And uh, this house is a real place. And we tracked down the current owners who bought it a number of years ago and are now renovating it. And uh, we were chatting with her. I believe she is uh, uh, in finance or an attorney, a professional in Chicago. And she was at her office and we were talking about the house and the Ferrari and Matthew Broderick and everything else like that, who's the star of the show. And then at the end, we sang Donkey Shane to her uh, on the show, uh, badly. <laughs> but it was really funny. And that was a great episode. And then more recently, um, we do a lot of historical research for our main website. I was uh, very fortunate to find a house that had been missing for 71 years. It was a house built in the garden of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, in 1950, and uh, after the show closed, it was an exhibition house. No one knew what happened to it. It just vanished, and people have been looking for it for 71 years. In 2017, the New York Times ran this huge article about the house being missing. Nothing, no, no clues, nothing. Um, I found it about 35 miles north of there and traced back all the families that had owned it and what had happened to the house and why it had disappeared and et cetera. And uh, the New York Times did another big article this last May, and we just recently did a whole podcast show interviewing a lot of people, some now in their 90s, uh, that were at that show in 1950. Wow. So that was pretty fun. Yeah, very cool. So, so how did you find it? How did you come across it? So um, persistence, really. Um, we would write the Museum of Modern Art every so often. And they would write back and say, well, we don't have this information. And, but they, they would always say it in a way like, we don't think we have this information or we're not sure we have this information. So I just would write every year or so. And then during the pandemic, they shut down the archives. And uh, about a year rolled by. And then they decided because of the pandemic that they, for the first time, would do remote requests for information from the archives before you had to actually go down there. Hmm. So the, the day the remote requests opened up online, I went online, requested the records, and they showed up. It's like, huh, well, you know, maybe somebody just, you know, put them in the wrong file drawer or something. I don't know. But um, that was about 300 pages. 
and digging through that uh, m- sort of massive amount of notes on something that happened 70 years ago, I was able to determine who bought the house. And then using deed records and Google Earth was able to find the house physically. Um, it's, it's still there, still in very good shape. The family who owns it now has been there 40 years and they love it. And uh, it's one, it's a great example of um, modernist architecture by the architect Gregory Ain. When it was in the Museum of Modern Art, tens of thousands of people came through. I mean, it was an incredibly popular museum exhibit. So I have listened to that episode. That is uh, an episode of yours I listened to, and it was fascinating. I and you really did a great job of building the story and and setting up you know how you discovered it. As I recall, um, the house has been added on to uh, since it was reconstructed. A little bit, mostly inside. Okay. Uh, this was a modular house that you could move walls around, um, and it had some additional little bonus rooms for different functions. Um, some of those have been reconfigured to create additional internal space. And then um, I, I think, I'm not 100% sure, they added on a little kind of um, outbuilding on the side of the house. But the, the, the basic shape and structure is, is intact. Uh, they didn't do any major renovations to the inside. And the family that's there now had created these really beautiful, lush gardens that surround the house. So I forget, have you had the opportunity to visit it yet? Not yet. Okay. Um, it's on my radar for after the pandemic. I was going to say, if, if you know when you're going to go there, let me know. I'll meet you there. That would be a yeah, blast. Yeah, sure. I would enjoy sure. that. Um, so it, it's interesting, you know, as we're as a manufacturer of building materials, and a lot of our products are used for um, what we call re-roofing or remodeling, but we get involved in some historical preservation projects and things where we're doing specialized custom parts and colors and things. But um, on the new construction end of things, you know, we get people sending us plans all the time, asking us to review their roofs and help them figure out what to do. And we're just seeing so many contemporary building designs. I mean, 20 years ago when I was doing this, every design that came through was what I called the McMansion design. I mean, I could oh, yeah. pretty much yeah. predict exactly what it was going to be like. Lots and, of gables. Yes, yes. Lots of gables and big boxes inside. Um, but, you know, today it's it's we're getting so many very contemporary designs that really seem to have a lot of modernist influences, a lot of glass, a lot of uh, lower pitch, long roofs, um, stone accents. Um, just curious, does it do your heart good to see some of these influences coming back around? Oh, sure. You know, um, modernism was as popular as it ever was, which again, as we said earlier, was not huge. And then around 1970, it fell out of favor because these houses didn't have great materials and people moved on to the contemporary styles that flourished in the 70s and 80s. Uh, in the 90s, modernism started to come back. And then by the 2000s and 2010s, it was really roaring and it's still going. So a lot of people now um, feel more free to choose these more non-traditional kind of designs uh, because there, there's more of them now than there ever were. Uh, there's so many new ones being put together. And, um, you know, what a lot of people don't know is that you don't have to be a multimillionaire to have a modernist house. I mean, modernism doesn't mean it has to be on the cover of Architecture Digest where they're all blinged out. Uh, some of the, the houses that are being built are very simple forms. Um, a lot of the housing is being designed for the homeless now in major cities looks quite modernist, modernist which is the more of these these simple forms being used and put together. And coincidentally, a lot of those have metal roofs, standing seam roofs um, that lend themselves very well to solar panels that can be used to provide energy for the house. I live in a house with a a metal seam roof with solar panels on top and a Tesla battery in the garage. And, you know, my utility bill is $14 a month. So I'm I'm a happy camper with all that combination. So you're seeing this resurgence and we're, we're seeing it as well, but you have these haters coming on your podcast. So I'm, yeah. I'm just curious, what do they hate and what do, what do they point to that they don't like? So it's, it's interesting. Um, people who hate 
modernist architecture the most, who are most vehement about it, um, have decided to associate it with, with the worst things they possibly can. Um, it's communism, it's the Nazis, uh, because a lot of the architects in the early days were German that came over here, <laughs> Mies van der Rohe, Gropius, Breuer, people like that. Uh, it must be some sign of undue influence on America. There's a lot of flag waving among these guys. Um, and it really has nothing to do with politics for the average person. It's just a, a different way of life. What has more to do with it, in, in a way, is the pandemic. Not ours, but the one that they had in 1918. Because that pandemic, or the Spanish flu, as it was called, um, you know, many, many people were sick. They didn't have nearly the medical uh, capabilities we had today. But the process was the same. Stay away from each other and wear masks. And that affected architecture profoundly. Um, in fact, um, there's a famous house in, in L.A. called the Lovell Health House, which was designed by Philip Lovell to be a more healthier way of living. It had uh, huge windows that you could open and bring in the breezes and uh, a place to, to swim in the house and a design that the light would affect all the rooms in a particular way so there were no dark rooms in the place. Um, that house is one of the classics of modernist architecture, and uh, it was sold recently to a couple who's going to be uh, restoring it, and we're really looking forward to that. It's going to take a couple of years to do. You had touched earlier on how some of the designs today for the homeless and so forth are incorporating some modernist designs. One of our guests in a uh, episode a few weeks ago uh, is developing what he calls cozy home communities, um, which are fairly modernist looking uh, buildings for seniors who are retiring. And interestingly enough, he's working with another great North Carolina company, Dell Tech Homes. Uh, is oh, sure, Dell Tech, yeah. yeah. One of his producers of those. So uh, kind of got me thinking about that a little bit. You had kind of touched on, you know, the development in window technology and and how far that's come. Roofing is the same way. I mean, you know, one of the the big comments that was always made about any right design, I keep deferring to right, but was that pretty much all of his roofs leaked, and he did like the the low, long, sweeping roofs. And uh, at the time, the technology was problematic for those roofs to to keep them from leaking and good thing is today we have ways to handle low slope roofs um i'm, I'm kind of curious to ask about kitchens <laughs> weird question but if someone has a modernist home and you know they're trying to restore it um what what would they typically do with the kitchen well there are two schools of thought on this really and I think both of them are fine. There's not one better than the other. But there are the purists who want to actually find like a 1954 oven in a junkyard somewhere and fix it up and get it working and shine it all up and put it in. Um, and then there are people who want to have very, very current kitchens and bathrooms. But the rest of the house, they typically want to restore to look as original as possible. Um, either of these strategies is fine. It's, it's really, I don't think there's any wrong way about it. Um, the thing you don't want to do is what I call the Priscilla Presley syndrome. Uh, Priscilla Presley, former wife of Elvis, took a perfectly good John Lautner modernist house and made it into an Italianate villa. Oh, wow. <laughs> so if you want an Italianate villa, just go buy an Italianate villa. Where was that at? In L.A., yeah. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll have to try to look that up. Might be good for some laughs or groans, I guess. I'm not sure. Groans, yeah. mostly. Yeah. Uh, curious, are, are there, and, and I don't know if there's a good answer, or if there is an answer to this. So um, are there any trends you're seeing in the world today, maybe not even in construction, that sort of scream at you that there's some modernist roots there? I mean, it, it is modernist design gone beyond that? I mean, it. you know, when I think back, I think back to, clothing designs in the 60s and you can certainly say those were modernist design and they kind of match what we're talking about in terms of architecture any other areas where you've seen the influence of modernist design for construction going into other areas well you know um 
over the last couple of years, the the not just in in housing but in in other things, you're looking at an integration of technology into houses themselves. So it's no longer just that there's a computer chip in your thermostat. Now you can talk to Alexa to talk to your thermostat to turn your coffee pot on. I mean, there's all this kind of high tech going into houses, um, and it's really cool to see what high tech meant say in 1954, you go into a house that was all blinged out then and they had a TV that was behind a hidden wall. That was very avant-garde. They had a hi-fi, which was the name of a stereo, where the record player folded out of the wall and you could put your album on it and play through speakers that were also hidden in the wall. And then they had room-to-room intercoms where you could speak to people in different places and you could play AM or FM radio generally through the house to um, have like background music. Um, you know, really fun things like that are, is one area in the technology. Um, I think that um, the other area that's, that's, that's bigger and more important now with climate change is that you've got green design which modernism has always been very green. It's always been oriented towards nature and the outdoors. Uh, modernist design was, was the first uh, school of thought really that looked at where was the sun, right? When you're building a house, if you wanted to get a Southern exposure, you've got to turn the house around to get that. Um, it profoundly affects heating and cooling and what you can do in the house and um, where you want the windows to be placed and, now it's routine for people who are building houses and other buildings to do sun studies to show how the sun is going to go across. Um, is it going to make the building too hot? Um, is it going to affect the roof in some way? Um, a lot of those Frank Lloyd Wright roofs that you were talking about, I mean, ultimately, probably only 30% of them failed, but it was enough to get a reputation, uh, especially with realtors who would tell their clients, don't buy a house with a flat roof. It was an indictment of all modernism. But uh, since rubber membrane roofs came along and other times of, of roofing structures that can be used to repair those, it's not been an issue. Yeah, absolutely. One of those big, big developments, that's for sure. Yeah. Are there any contractors? So if someone has a modernist home or, or um, maybe they want to build one, um, are, are there contractors across the country who specialize in helping folks um, build out a, a modernist home? There are, but that you have to do a little work to find them. Uh, don't trust your cousin, Earl, who tells you, sure, yeah, I can build a modernist house, no problem. I mean, how hard could it be? <laughs> Turns out pretty hard. Uh, it's not like building a traditional stilt bit ha sticks. Ah stick built house with gables. Um, you want to be researching from the get go, who are the builders in the area who have done modern? You want to get them involved in the conversation with your architect early, like even when you're designing the house. And, and here's why. What most people do, which is terrible, is they go through the whole design process with their architect and then they send the project out for bids, right? So now this is the first time that real builders have seen these plans and they come back with their bids and they pick the lowest bid generally and they start construction. And now they begin to witness the cage fighting that goes on between their architect and their builder. Well, this is completely avoidable. When architects know up front who the good builders are, why not get them in the conversation during design so you can avoid costly mistakes, you can avoid conflicts that are going to turn up because that way something doesn't get designed that, that really can't be built or can't be built for a reasonable cost. And, and that's the way to go that ultimately save you a ton of money if you're doing a project like that. Very interesting. We uh, a, another previous episode of Construction Disruption had an architect, Evan Troxel, and and Evan spoke a lot about how he feels that you need to get con your contractor and the architect and even product suppliers 
talking early rather than yes. talking at the end. And that's where substitutions get made and you discover that uh, budgets aren't what you'd hoped and all kinds of compromises end up taking place. Well, you know, um, unfortunately, we, we have this thing called HGTV, which people watch way too much of. And, and HGTV is fine. I mean, I'm a fan. I watch it too. But people create these absurd Pinterest pages and long list of items. And so they'll walk into an architect's office with their list of a hundred things they want in their house and just say, here, design me a house to do all this. Well, right away, you have completely gutted the talent that you've hired the architect for. What you really want to do is dispense with that list initially and go in and tell your architect, what do you want the house to do? Is it a performance space for my grand piano? Is it a place to keep my six kids and our four dogs? Is it where my mother's going to be moving in in three years? Is it where we can have crazy parties every summer out in the backyard for 200 people? What do you want the house to actually do for you? And then what you're paying the architect for is to use this information to be able to construct a design that will accomplish what you want. Uh, in the process, architects can do it in less square footage generally than if you went to a contractor for the same thing, because this is how architects are trained. So a lot of people think that there's no reason, why should I spend money on an architect? Well, the reason is, is that if you're wanting a, a, a 3,000 square foot house, you might be able to get a 2,400 square foot house that lives like a 3,000 square foot house for less money. That's very interesting, and and you're right. Leave it leave it to the professionals, I guess, is the summary there, and bring in the folks yeah. who uh, are experienced and trained and know what they're doing. Yeah, I would love to hear more about what your experience was like building a modernist house, and then just because I'm curious if you could describe the place you ended up building a little bit more for us. Oh, sure, sure. So um, my house was uh, greatly influenced by falling water, Frank Lloyd Wright's Masterpiece House in Pennsylvania. Not by the house itself, but my trip to visit. Mm. Uh, everyone needs to make a pilgrimage, who's a modernist fan, to Mill Run, Pennsylvania, middle of nowhere, uh, and visit this. It's a, it's a great, great trip. They have a wonderful visitor center and guides that take you through this unbelievable house. Uh, no photo or video uh, does this house justice to you actually there. So I went, did the trip, came home about six o'clock at night. I, I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed with the house. I just can't believe it. I mean, it's just, it's just the most incredible residence I've ever seen. And I want to build a modernist house. So I did what any person would, would do, I guess. Um, I went to Michael's, the craft store, and bought sheets and sheets and sheets of styrofoam and an X-Acto knife and some pins. And um, like Richard Dreyfus stayed up all night in close encounters of the third kind and built a giant mountain out of mashed potatoes, I stayed up all night and built a house model out of styrofoam and, uh, and took it in to an architect, the first appointment. And he goes, now, George, this is not how architecture works. <laughs> We're supposed to make the model for you. <laughs> But they, they took the model and, and modified it quite a bit and, uh, and ended up with a design. We've been in the house now 11 years. Uh, it's still fantastic. It's only 2,400 square feet, but it lives much larger. Uh, most people estimate about 3,200 square feet if we ask them to guess the size of the house. And we just couldn't be happier. So that must have been really something to see your dream come to completion after going to Falling Water and having that sort of uh, inspiration and influence and then making it happen. What, what was the time period to make all that happen? So um, it was fairly short. I mean, it took about nine months to work through the design issues with the architect. And then it was about um, maybe 10 months for construction, roughly. It wasn't a very long time because it wasn't that big a house, really. And we had, it, we had some delays that could have made it much shorter. Um, we tore down a house, just an old brick ranch, nothing special, to build this. And the, the woman who owned the demolition company uh, parked a giant bulldozer in the yard and demanded payment before she would do anything. 
And usually, you know, people get paid after the fact. So there was a standoff with the bulldozer in the house for a while. And then we had this, you know, six weeks of constant rain, which uh, made the place a mess and kind of hard to dig your foundations in mud. So that that put things off a bit. But once we got rolling, it really went quite well. And um, the builder was highly experienced in modern. And that was critical because they had the right subcontractors. So um, uh, there was one uh, subcontractor who did the framing and, and they were just almost like magical figures. And they would come in the morning at exactly eight o'clock in the trucks and they would work to exactly five o'clock and you would walk in there at 502 and the place was clean, like no dirt, no dust, no nails, no piles of trash. It was just like, it's just perfect every single day. We would watch this happen. That's uh, that's a good builder for you. That's fantastic. Yeah. So I'm curious, where is your either your favorite place in the home or maybe your favorite part of the home? Well, um, the place I spend most time is in the office that I built in the house. Uh, it's where I am eight hours a day, almost every day. But we built a large back deck that overlooks the lake. So it's great to be back there. And uh, looking out on the water, cooking dinner on the grill. Uh, we have a little fire pit um, that we put out there so we can turn that on and sit by that. Uh, it's very relaxing. And even here in December, we've had some evenings where it's just, you know, high 50s, low 60s. So it's very comfortable to be out there and hang out. And um, people come by all the time and take pictures of the house from front because we're the only modernist house in the neighborhood. Uh, that's not unusual in many communities is that the modernist house is that strange one down the street. <laughs> yeah. It's the only one like it. So, uh, you know, when I go out to the mailbox and somebody's walking by, they'll want to ask me questions. So it's fun. So what are the exterior walls of your home? Just trying to get a picture of it. Uh, so our house is dark gray on the outside. It has um, cedar siding which has been uh, painted with this sort of nuclear powered Sherwin Williams paint. There you go. It's supposed to, you know, withstand a direct attack. I don't know. It's, it's, <laughs> it's pretty strong stuff. And, um, there are, um, uh, steel strips along it to give it kind of an accent. Okay. Um, along the side of it, uh, the front of the house, they're only, uh, I believe, the doorway at, to go in and then uh, two small windows. And then the back of the house is almost all windows so that you're looking out onto the lake. Very nice. Well, this has been really fun. I've really enjoyed it. And uh, I encourage everyone to check out usmodernist.org. Now, is NC Modernist still up as well? It's still up. We run both organizations. Uh, NC Modernist does a lot of programs local to the Triangle area of North Carolina. We have a party every month called Thirst for Architecture. We have an architecture movie series. It's online that anybody can access. And if people want to find out more about either organization, they can go to either U.S. Modernist or NC Modernist and sign up for our newsletter. You've done a great job of just taking that whole modernist feel and and experience and bringing it into uh, your life, it sounds like, as well. And that's uh, pretty cool. Well, you know, nothing surprises me more than how many people uh, want to go along on this journey, too. I mean, it's something that the people, they like. It's generally not the first thing in their life. They're not architects. They're not designers. They're not builders. They're something else. This is maybe eight or nine or 10 in the list of life priorities, but they found a, a gang of people to hang out with to enjoy it. Um, we take these folks on trips. We take them to Palm Springs for Modernism Week. We do local tours. We take people to Europe and they love it. They love the, being able to dive deep into modernism. So much is about community and finding those affinity groups and those people you yeah. can really enjoy things with. Well, this has been great. Well, before we close out, um, I have to ask you if you'd like to participate in something we call rapid fire questions. Um, so these are seven questions. They may range from serious to silly. 
All you have to do is give the first thing that pops into your head. And our audience needs to understand if George agrees to do this, he has no idea what we're about to ask him. So George Smart, are you up this to This is challenge? like Ellen DeGeneres. I think she does this on her show. <laughs> that might be. I don't know. I'm always, I'm always working during the Ellen show, so I've never seen Uh-huh. That. Okay. All right, Ellen, let's go. You're up to the challenge. Okay, away we go. Favorite building? The Frey 2 House in Palm Springs, California. Frey 2 House. Tell me a little bit about it. So Albert Frey was a well-known architect in Palm Springs. He designed this 800 square foot house on the side of a mountain overlooking the town of Palm Springs. It is now owned by the art museum. Okay. Uh, you can tour it during modernism week and other times. And it's just, it's just a perfect little getaway place. If I could buy it and live there, I would. So this must be over in what I call kind of the old Palm Springs area. That's right. Yeah, yes. I love that experience. I always expect to see the Rat Pack come walking down the road whenever I'm there. Okay, next one. Um, place you'd most like to travel to? I want to go to Dubai for the World's Fair, which is going on right now. And in fact, in March, I am going. Oh, wow. Uh, we are taking a group there. Uh, the World's Fair has not been in America for a long time. It's been elsewhere around the world. But people who are older do remember the 1964 World's Fair in New York. Um, in the 30s, there was another one. There's been one in Seattle. That's where the Space Needle came from. The World's Fairs are, are really incredible spectacles of technology, culture, society, government. And plus, Dubai is off the chain as far as wild buildings go. Absolutely. So that's where I want to head to next. Anything uh, in particular at the Dubai World's Fair that you know you want to see? Well, um, there are 190 pavilions, as in buildings, constructed, one for each nation of the world. Goodness. Uh, it's like Epcot times six or eight. Wow. So um, I, I, won't, I won't get to see them all. There's no way I can see 190, even in like three or four days. So uh, just just seeing the, the scale of all this, I mean, they have to build an entire transportation network just to get people back and forth to the expo. Well, I've been a really bad rapid fire guy and made you already answer a whole lot more than seven questions, but we still have five more. Um, so have you ever had a nickname? And if so, would you be willing to share it with us? Um, well, when I was uh, in college, I was called Max. Max. Uh, as in Maxwell Smart, which was based on a TV character uh, played by Don Adams in a TV show called Get Smart. Absolutely. It was on in the late 60s, early 70s. Hey, that was even that modernist type thing back then, too. Right. A little bit, yeah. Are you a morning or an evening person? I would say more morning. What do you think is the best age to be? The best age to be? A 39, clearly. There you yeah. go. That makes sense. Okay, top half or bottom half of the bagel? Uh, the one with the sesame seeds on it, whichever one that is. Okay. Usually top. Probably top half. That makes sense. Yeah, man after my own heart now, I can tell. <laughs> um, okay, final rapid fire question. What are your feelings on cranberries? Cranberries? Well, um, I don't want to get too bogged down in that issue, but I'm bum. Uh, That's good. They're very tasty. They're tart, a little too tart for me, actually, to consume them in their natural state. So um, I'm a pomegranate man now. Oh, man, I love pomegranates. They're a yeah. pain to clean. I hate going through that process. Yeah. But, uh, or you can get the juice, the palm juice at the grocery store. Yeah, I need to try that. Mix that with a little vodka and club soda, and you've got a party. There hey, you go. You got my weekend planned for me. <laughs> hey, this has been great. Thank you so much. Um, really enjoyed it. Uh, your insight uh, into modernist design and influence is absolutely great incredible and and certainly encourage folks to check out again uh, US Modernist Radio and also usmodernist.org. So is there anything that you'd like to share that we haven't covered today? Well, I, I just want to tell people about um you know, um metal roofs are a good thing. I am an owner and uh you know, besides the fact that they're durable and all that. Uh it's pretty cool when it rains 
and you can hear the rain tinkling on your metal roof. Fantastic. Um, if you ever had grandparents who lived in houses with old metal roofs, which were leaky before the technology got very good, it's that same kind of comforting sound when the rain comes down. So that's one of my favorite memories of that. But um, yeah, you, you've got to change the name of that conference. That's for sure. <laughs> hey, I, I think yeah, we, we, that'll, ha that'll have to happen soon. Well, this has been great. So why might someone want to contact or connect with you and how would they go about doing that? I am the world's easiest person to find. Uh, my phone number and email address are on every page of our websites. It's on Google. Um, just type in George Smart Modernist and you'll find you know me in a few seconds. Well, I can tell that you enjoy talking or connecting with people and talking about what you love too. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's it's fun to talk with people, and then they they call with different things. They're trying to find a house that their grandparents lived in, or they're trying to find um, you know a, uh, a part for an air conditioning system that's no longer made, or they're trying to uh, to save something. Like um, we get calls occasionally where people are in a house that's being sold, and they found these boxes of plans or magazines or models or anything architectural. And they're, they're worried they're going to have to throw it away. So we go and get it a lot of the time and save it. Very neat. Well, thank you again. This has been a real delight. I've enjoyed it. Thank you so much for your time and for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, Todd, I really enjoyed that conversation with George. Uh, certainly fun uh, speaking to anybody who has that much passion for whatever they're talking about and, and spend their life devoting their life to. I know you've been interested in modernist architecture for a while yourself. would love to hear what you you took away and enjoyed about that conversation. It's pretty cool, though, because you could tell with George that he's living out his passion and living something. And, oh, gosh, why, what great opportunity that is and probably no better place a person could end up. And uh, that was neat to visit with him and learn about that. Kind of interesting couple things he talked about. Uh, one was falling water. Um, I tried to visit falling water once and uh, couldn't find it, which was very odd. Actually, we were getting close. It was a long, arduous drive. We were getting close, and I think I tried to call them to see how long they were open. Found out they were closed for renovation after we were about three quarters of the way there. Oh, so, uh, so never have gotten to visit it. But you know, then he mentioned this. Uh, what was it Frey Two House out of outside of Palm Springs? Mm -hmm. And you had pulled it up on your phone then. And uh, I recall I've seen that uh, sitting up in the mountains outside of Palm Springs. And uh, Palm Springs is just such a cool place. And a lot of that is because of the modernist architecture and the way that it blends into the natural surroundings. Um, it's just a fantastic feeling there that just your cares go away and it's so relaxing. And I thought that was interesting how George brought that out, how this sort of design just is so simple and so relaxing and so calming uh, compared to other types of design that have a lot of uh, degrees of elements and details and things that just kind of drive you nuts after a while. So uh, fantastic. That was, that was a real pleasure. Certainly a, a great episode and great to meet George that way. Yeah, it was here, interesting hearing him talk about the contrast, but still uh, just a ton of character in these houses, contrasting with the ornate Victorians that came before them. And I love those those four principles of modernist architecture, four principles of being the weird house in the neighborhood. You know, a couple of them, you know, clear design preferences, but bringing the outside in, open spaces, all facilitating just, um, yeah, peace, relaxation, and, and spending time with people. We can take those principles into any area of architecture that we're interested in. Maybe any aspect of our lives, I guess, yeah, if I think about it. Absolutely. Good stuff. Thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Construction Disruption with our special guest, George Smart of U.S. Modernist Radio. Please watch for future episodes of our podcast. We have more great guests on tap in coming weeks. Don't forget, please, to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or YouTube. Um, until then, we always encourage everyone, change the world for someone, make them smile, bring them encouragement, bring them hope. All of these are very simple 
but yet powerful things we can do to change the world one interaction at a time. In the meantime, God bless, take care. This is Isaiah Industries signing off until the next episode of Construction Disruption.